I got a kick out of everybody Wednesday night. I think I got four texts, and please keep them coming. Uh, but I got four texts to remind me to uh, to record, and uh, and I need those because otherwise, this seventy three year old brain won't remember them. So, uh, okay, well we're in uh, chapter twenty two of first kings we're not even out of first kings yet uh and the you know the big the big prophets let me there um uh, elijah and elisha are not even mentioned in this chapter um uh, we 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 meet a new prophet in in this chapter and we and we meet 400 other prophets and we can talk about uh you know whether those are Yahweh's prophets or whether they are uh the little e Elohim's prophets uh so all right get my clicker working all right so um we're going to start back in in 1 Kings 15:24 because it talks about a new king uh, that that we're going to discuss today, and and quite a bit more. Uh, Asa, who was a good king of the south, we're talking about Judah here, died and slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, I never can pronounce that right, and I certainly can't spell it. And boy, did that give me a hard time today because he's mentioned about 50 times in, in this. And you'd think I could have spelled it by the time it was over. But anyway, Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his stead. And I think everybody on here knows that Jehoshaphat was a good king. Uh, so in Second Chronicles, it tells us that. And, and Yahweh was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the first ways of his father David and didn't seek Balaam or Baalim, but sought to the, to, to the, uh, it's hard for me to say these together, uh, Yahweh Elohim of his father and walked in his commandments and not after the doings of Israel. Okay, and we know that what were the doings of Israel? Well, they were worshiping uh, Baal, Baal, and uh, the uh, Asherah, uh, the high places, the groves, and they they had uh, almost, as a whole, had abandoned God. And uh, Jehoshaphat was not going to do that. So, uh, in, in addition to uh, coming across Jehoshaphat, uh, there's another prophet in this chapter, a new prophet for us. His name is Micaiah. M M K M well, anyway, let's just go with Micaiah. He was the son of Imlah. And uh, we're also introduced to this new king, Jehoshaphat. And he was mentioned in that uh, verse 15 that I told you about. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. Now, one thing that pu that's, that puzzled me in this chapter, and as, as a matter of fact, it's not just in this chapter, but for some reason, and I, you know, I don't know if there's a reason or not, but for some reason, uh, the uh, the writers of of uh, First Kings, at least in, in this part of it. Uh, has they that he or they or she have written very little about Judah and about the kings of Judah? Almost everything that we've said up to this point has been about the northern tribes, and most of the author's words concern the northern kingdom or Israel. Huh? You know, I don't know. Maybe it was because they went off track so early. Uh, they went off track before uh, before. Judah did, and we we learn a little bit uh, about uh, Jehoshaphat in this chapter, but there's much more that we're going to come across uh, later on. 
And while Ahab was doing just massive damage uh, to Israel's worship of of uh, of God, uh, Jehoshaphat was doing the opposite in Judah. And Jehoshaphat was a good king, but he's not. He wasn't perfect. Second Chronicles. Oops, that's the one I'd already done. Okay. Now, we find out later that he removed the high places, some of them. And we'll find that while he did re remove the high places, some of the people of Judah continued to worship the false gods. You know, I think, I think some of us have in our, in our minds, I, I know I did, that Judah was great and wonderful and all they did was worship the Father. But later on, you know, they went the wrong direction. But uh, based on scriptures I've read, uh, a lot of them from the very beginning uh, of the, you know, right after the split began worshiping the false gods. So now we have a king who follows the most high God, who walks in his commandments, but he gets mixed up with the most evil king on the earth. This is one of those things I was talking about that that puzzles me. Why on earth did Jehoshaphat get involved with Ahab? How His father-in-law. Exactly. That, that's exactly right. Um, yeah, the, uh, the son of Jehoshaphat married the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. Now, looking back, I, I think we can probably see where there's going to be some problems here. Uh, and uh, so her name was Athaliah, and she married Jehoshaphat's son, Jehoram, who would later become king of Judah. Now, one thing, remember, if, if you do any searches, there are two, there may be more, but there are two specific Jehorams, and one was the king of the south, and one was the king of the north. So you can get all mixed up. So you got to look at context when you're studying about those guys. It can get real confusing. Um, and uh, I'm jumping way ahead here, but I, I, I do want to mention this. Mark, uh, Mark mentioned it. At the death of, of Jehoram, the king of Judah, Athaliah, the daughter of Jezebel, actually reigned in Judah. The, 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 the Judeans, I suppose would be the right name, uh, allowed her to, uh, I don't know if it was sit on the throne or to run the show, but she's just like her mother, which is not surprising, but those events will come later. We'll, we'll hit those in, uh, uh, in, in Chronicles. And, and one of the things that we're going to see going forward is that a lot of the stuff that we read about in First Kings is almost verbatim uh, written in Chronicles. So just just remember that we'll we'll run into that a little bit later. Now, strangely enough, there's there's nothing that's said about Jezebel in this chapter. It's Ahab and uh, Jehoshaphat. Uh, but we can see her leadership, or lack thereof, uh, in action. The two fathers-in-law are getting along fine, which really kind of blows me away how Jehoshaphat, a good king, gets along fine with Ahab, but there again, their their fathers-in-law, they're, they're, you know, they're not kin, but their kids are, and those of us who who have had uh, fathers, I was very fortunate that I had a great father-in-law, but I'm sure some people uh, have have had fathers-in-law and mothers-in-law who were not the easiest people to get along with. But these two guys got along fine. Just, I, I don't know any other way to put it other than it just blows me away. Um, so they got along so well that King Jehoshaphat leaves his duties in Judah 
to go to the north to help his son's father-in-law. And this is not pleasing to God, by the way. So now we're three years past where we left in the last chapter, where uh, there, there was war with the Arameans. That's not Arabians, that's Arameans. It says three years passed without war between Aram and Israel. And in the third year, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. Remember, we're dealing with uh, elevation, not with north and south, uh, because he went north, but but the the riders uh, put uh, down. Now, one other thing that, that that surprises me a little bit about this is that the author or authors of First Kings, at least in in these sections that we're in now almost never mentions the name the name of the king of Israel. They don't say Ahab. They say, and you see it in, in verse two here, in the third year of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah came down to the king of Israel. I would have written, came down to see Ahab, but you know, God didn't have me write any of the scriptures. Thank, thank goodness. Uh, they regularly use the name of the king of Judah, but they don't use the name of the king of Israel. Anybody got a thought on that? Because I certainly don't. I mean, I just know that I, I kept reading king of Israel, king of Israel, king of Israel. Uh, I think it honors someone to say their name, and maybe it doesn't bestow as much on the individual if you just say the title. It's just a thought. That's a good point. It's a real good point, Tom. Thanks. Okay, so uh, that really was a good point. Jehoshaphat, who was a good king, followed the law of God. He He's the fifth king of Judah since King David. His father, Asa, was a good king, and his son, Jehoram, who followed in his steps to obey God, but married Jezebel's daughter. That's another one that just kind of blows me away. You've got a good king, uh, a, a king who follows Yahweh, follows the law, but married Jezebel's daughter. Now, uh, one of the commentaries that I read said that that uh, they thought she was like 15 years old. So this was a, kind of an arranged marriage. It had to be political, uh, certainly from, uh, from Ahab's uh, standpoint. So now a couple of dates for you. Ahab and, and Jehoshaphat reigned about the same time. Uh, but Jehoshaphat reigned three extra years as the co-regent with his father Asa. Now, Asa had fallen, and I don't know, uh, I've, I've fallen and, and shattered my heel, so I know what that's like, uh, but it, it messed up his feet. And Asa reigned from 911 to 870. Now, you will notice that, that um, Ahab reigned from 874 to 853, and Jehoshaphat, from 873 to 848. Now that's that extra three years uh, because technically he wasn't king of, of Judah uh, until 870. So he got three years uh, where he was the co-regent, I think is the term uh, that, they, that they call. Okay, so Ahab was the sixth king of Israel and followed in the evil steps of his father, Omri, and if you remember what was going on back then, you didn't want to be king of the north because you were going to get killed. You weren't going to live long. You're going to be you're going to be slaughtered. You're going to be killed in your sleep, or so or uh, friendly fire would get you uh, if you were if you were in a war and all kinds of. They had five or six kings just in a short like ten or twelve year period. I, that's from memory. I, I didn't uh, check that out. So okay. So now, why did Ahab 
want to, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to do like Tom said. I'm not going to call him a head. Why did the king of Israel want Jehoshaphat to come and sit down with him? Now the king of Israel, there it is again, said to his servants, do you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us? And if you remember, we, we talked about uh, Gilead and I'm not sure we talked specifically about Ramoth Gilead. Uh, that's where Elijah was born. And I assume grew up. But, but uh, uh, the king of, of Israel said, do you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us and we're still doing nothing? to take it out of the hand of the king of, of Aaron. And here's, here's a map. And I didn't do it, Jim. I apologize. I did not make my mouse any larger. But Ramoth Gilead is right here. You see where the pink is? It's right on the border. He's on the border of Manasseh, half tribe of Manasseh on the eastern side of, of the river. And right on the border of, see Gad right here, right on the border of Gad. That's where Ramoth Gilead is. That's where uh, the area where Elijah was born. Okay. The, it, it's going to be hard. I've got Ahab written all through my notes, so if I mess up, you all please forgive me. But the king of Israel's daughter, and Jehoshaphat's son had been married a few years when Ahab had a large celebration and invited Jehoshaphat. And it's obvious that his reasoning was to join Israel with Judah in order to capture Ramoth Gilead. And Jehoshaphat foolishly agreed. And I, you know, I, I'm sorry, maybe I shouldn't talk about a king of, of Judah, but man, that was dumb. But anyway, he foolishly I, agreed and he, he even said something that kind of blows me away. He's, he's, and I've got it in scripture later on. He said, your people are my people and my people are your people. This is what Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel. I have a comment. Yeah, Mark. I, I think it, um, from our perspective in the 21st century, and those, we all go back to the 20th century. So from just from our perspective at this day and time, we read the Bible and we think in religious terms. I think we, this is a good example for us to to illustrate to us that Israel and Judah were acting just as all the other countries were around them. They, as you already said, they, this was an alliance. This was a political alliance. The marriage was a political alliance. That's why Jehoshaphat says, your people are as my people. They had an alliance. Uh, together. It wasn't religious, it was political. It was nation state. This is how the nations around them operated. Um, so that it helps explain, I think, some of these things that we see and kind of trouble us. Why isn't Judah doing the things that we think they ought to do to guide them as a nation from their perspective with regard to to the to God, it's because they were acting just like all the other nations around them. This was over a hundred years after David lived, well over that. And um, you know, it, it's from the dates that you put up just a couple of minutes ago. Think about what we think of in regards to a hundred years now. We're totally removed from that. We do things in a different way, right? That's just the way life is. And so I think that it is helpful to, re to remember some of that when we read, we read through this and, and helps us to understand their reasoning. That's it. Yeah, that, make, that makes a lot of sense. This is a, a, 
This is a secular relationship between, it's political, uh, to, to join together two nations that, I mean, obviously they're much stronger as, two na- as one nation than they are uh, two nations. It just, it just still kind of blows me away how in the world, uh, but I understand you're exactly right. I understand what you're well, saying. Well, I, I good, again, I didn't think about that until just just now that you, you know after you mentioned something. But think of it in our terms. Who do we have alliances with? We one of our biggest alliances in the Middle East um, is Saudi Arabia. Totally different religion, different way of looking at life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now that relationship is being stressed right now, but for years we and the the king's a dictator they and all sorts of things happen etc i mean he's a king but he is a strong the the saudi arabia is a strong or has been a strong ally of ours in the middle east and yet we have totally different cultures etc 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 that's just a example uh, that's another good point another good point so in uh uh Second Chronicles, you know, you, we've got First Kings, Second Kings, First Chronicles, Second Chronicles, and so much of the stuff that we're going to be reading and 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 people we're going to study are talked about both places. So here's something from Second Chronicles 18, talking about our new king Jehoshaphat. I say new king, new new to to our study, I suppose. He had great riches and honor, and, and we eventually we're going to get to why he had great riches and honor. But anyway, and he allied himself how by marriage with Ahab. It's a political uh, marriage, and it says some years later he went down to visit Ahab. Remember, it's uh, elevation again uh, at, at Samaria, and Ahab. He had a big banquet for him, slaughtered many sheep and oxen for him and the people who were with him, and induced him to go up against Ramoth Gilead. Now, you know, human beings are going to be impressed with when somebody, uh, you know, sets them up in the place of honor, has a great big celebration on their behalf, and, and so on. It's, it's, you know, we're humans. And and Jehoshaphat was was a human, but anyway, says uh, and right here is one of the rare places that it mentioned his name. Ahab, king of Israel, said to Jehoshaphat, "Will you go with me against Ramoth Gilead?" And here's the the part, and I know you 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 cleared this up, but it's still I can't you know I just can't help it. Uh, he says, I am as you are, my people is your people, and we will be with you in the battle. And uh, we, we're going to find out later on that God was not real wild about this. Skip? Yeah, Jim. I mean, you, you know, in a sense, you know, if you just look at it as nations, like Mark was saying, just look at it as nations. I mean, this makes a lot of sense. Uh, The Ramoth Gilead area was given to one of the 10 tribes of Israel. And, or one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And, you know, it is normal, you know, it's sort of a normal thing for, for, uh, you to want all of Israel, you know, that they got when they came out of Egypt to be together. And you don't want foreigners ruling over it. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of, you know, as Mark was saying, political rationale for this. I mean, and, and the intermarriage thing, I mean, we saw that with the, uh, the kings of uh, Great Britain, the kings of England intermarried with many of the uh, of the uh, kings, you know, of other nations in Europe. Yeah, yeah, and, and Solomon Solomon was the champion of that. 
Skip. Yeah, he had lots of little lapses. <laughs> yeah, Barb. Yeah, uh, from what I can see here, it looked like that they would really like to go back into the glory days of David and get back together again and be one nation. Yeah, that's an interesting point, and and I I wonder which king thought that he should be in 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 charge. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a whole. We have our own experiences in our own church culture about that. That's not a good thing. You know what what's striking about all of this? Again, this is, and you mentioned it briefly that this is the result of a people that no longer trust Yahweh Elohim. These are people that wanted a king, and now we're going to emulate the nations around them. And this is how nations create these entangling alliances, uh, you know, to better serve their own interests. And it, it, it's not that they wanted to be unified under one, uh, you know, spiritual uh, uh, leadership, you know, under, under Yahweh Elohim, which is what made them a single nation. Um, and now that uh, the Northern Ten Tribes have, have abandoned God for Baals, um, what, what, how could they be united except again through a political marriage, which, you know, I don't know who arranged that or how it was arranged. And now we're going to entice the, uh, the, 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 the king of, uh, Judah to send his own people to uh, join the slaughter for Ramoth Gilead. How come the Northern 10 tribes can't, uh, fight off, uh, that enemy themselves? Why do they have to get Israel, uh, I mean, uh, uh Judah involved? That, that'd be a question I would want to ask. You know, the Israel, except Levi was, so to speak, in charge of the religious part of this. And so this is kind of normal behavior between different tribes. Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. I, I'm not saying it was right. But it sure makes a lot of sense, and uh, you know, and kings aren't necessarily the religious guys. Certainly not the northern ones. Yeah, definitely not, or or at least not the right kind of religious guys. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah. But you know, their job is to be king. You know, and obviously they should worship God. But their job is to be king, not to be priests. And so that may be part of it, too. They Just their thinking was different. Yeah, when you abandon your foundational principles, when you abandon your foundations, you start uh, making decisions based on uh, ideologies and, uh, and concepts which are alien and foreign to your very existence. We're seeing that today. And it looks here that that's, this is where the path of their total destruction really was being laid because once you abandon your foundation you know how can you possibly you know uh, not only act in accordance with that which established you how do you maintain it you can't you start making huge mistakes one after the other until you basically uh fulfill the curses of deuteronomy 28. yeah you mentioned uh, michael that you know how how come they couldn't uh defend themselves if, if you remember and it may have been two weeks ago uh it, it was talking about that all israel could uh, muster up was seven thousand men plus 232 uh leaders uh to to go up against the what was it 120 thousand uh of uh I'm not sure who was it Syria. I can't remember who it was, but uh, he had he had uh, decimated the 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 army of uh, of the northern tribes. So anyway, okay. So so Ahab asks for help from Judah to reclaim the lands of Ramoth Gilead, and this is where Jehovah says this strange, uh, jo Josephat, not Jehovah, Josephat says that strange thing. And it's strange to me. It may not be strange to you all. Our people are one. Uh, and and I, I'm like, how can he say this? They worship totally different gods. Uh, one group worships uh, 
the, the most high Elohim. And the other one worships the little Elohim and, and require human sacrifice. Skip, it was Ahab that said this, not Jehoshaphat. So the bad king says to the good king. Yeah, you're right. The he in there threw me. I thought, okay, so Ahab, king of Israel, said to Jehoshaphat, okay, will you go with me? And he said to him, I am as you are. See, I, you, you can see, you could go either way with that, but I'll, I'll accept your uh, explanation because it's so rare that you're right. Do I, I get it once in a while. Do I hear chuckles out there? <laughs> no, that does. Yeah, I can. This. Yeah, yeah, I can be taken either way. So, yeah, you, you, you may be exactly right. Uh, so I, I will skip that part of my notes. Um, okay. So, Jehoshaphat, being a worshiper of Yahweh Elo Elohim, asks for confirmation of this battle from Yahweh. So and th this part's almost funny. So Ahab gets 400 prophets for him to ask. Well, number one, where in the world did the 400 prophets come from? Uh, Elijah had taken out 850 of them. Uh, most of the commentaries say these prophets were from the school of prophets in Israel. And I couldn't find much about, about, about that. But anyway, uh, I think we're going to find out that these were not prophets of, of the one true God. Uh, they were, uh, they were yes men and maybe women, but they were yes men to tell the king of Israel, what he wanted to hear. Verse five, it says, moreover, Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, please inquire first for the word of Yahweh. You know, I, I want to hear what Yahweh has to say. I, I'm, not, I'm not buying this 400 uh, uh, prophet thing where you've brought in these guys that, tell you what you want to hear. So the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400, and said, ask them, shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I remain? And they all knew that Ahab wanted to join up with the south, and so they're, they're, they're going, sure, go up. For the Lord, and I don't know here uh, whether they're saying Yahweh here or not. I really don't think they are. I don't know what word they would use for for the Lord, and I do realize that the word Elohim is in uh, the translation, but I, you know, I don't know what they actually said. But anyway, go up, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. But Jehoshaphat was not fooled. He said, yeah, I'm, listen, these guys work for you. You pay them. They're going to say everything you want them to say, and they know what you want them to say. So he says, isn't there a prophet of Yahweh here that may, we may require of him? Now, several of the commentaries that I, that I checked mentions that, that these prophets, these 400, were prophets of the Lord. But how could they be? Jehoshaphat even asked, aren't there any prophets of, of Yahweh in Israel? Well, if he thought these were prophets of Yahweh, he had 400 of them. Why would he be looking for one from, from Yahweh? So that the term uh, in verse six, go up for the Lord will give it to that. What, what uh, translation is this? Uh, this is NASB. Okay, so the the um, I'm reading the 
New English translation. The king of Israel said to, oh, let me back up. Shall we go up to the battle against Ramoth Gilead or shall I refrain? And they said, go up for God will give it to the hand of the king. And the Hebrew word behind that is Elohim. So it is not referring to Yahweh. It, and you notice that in your, your point here, it's not all caps. If you go up to the, uh, please inquire first for the word of the Lord, the all caps in this translation indicates the word Yahweh. So down here, go up for the Lord. And I'm not sure why they translated that because it, if they followed convention, that would be God in the English, which is generally from the term Elohim. And that's what it is. Go up for the Elohim. We'll give it to the hand of the king. And of course, we understand about Elohim, that it is a place of residence. It's, it's not, uh, it mostly refers to the one true God, Yahweh, but it is used of all sorts of other beings also. Hey, Mark, if yeah. memory serves me correctly, <clears throat> right before these verses uh, or before this instant of this banquet, would, would that not be the, uh, the time and place that uh, you gave us that uh, seminar on the divine council that that uh, uh, segment on Ahab where the decision was made within the divine council. It's, 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 Ahab, following, it's following this. Oh, following this, because I think if I remember when you went through that study that uh, that uh, Yahweh Elohim was asking, OK, I need Ahab out of the picture and how are we going to achieve this? <clears throat> and if I remember correctly, and you, you had read the passage that uh, these other Elohim were going to put a lying tongue or a lying spirit in the in, in the prophets of the king, uh, and that's so. That's what I'm wondering if that's what we're reading here. But because it it follows immediately. I'm assuming Skip will go through that, but. In any case, that term, go up for the Lord, is just, it is the term Elohim. And then Jehoshaphat said, is there not yet a prophet of Yahweh here that we may inquire of him? And my reading of this would be that those prophets here are just, the they're the ones in the nation of Israel. They're, who knows, they're basically prophets of Baal. Skip's gone. Yeah, did, did he, was he not? Sorry, a, about we, that. Sorry about that. No, I, 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 I have to, to interrupt you here for a second. Um, I usually speak uh, uh, texts and it doesn't always get things right. And one of the things that I've learned with my phone is that if, I, if I'm if i sending a text, I was asking Diane to get me something, uh, some liquid. And uh, w what happens is that it, anything that's said after I say that, uh, it, it just starts typing that stuff out. So it picked up some of your all's uh, conversation, or I'm not sure where it came from, but anyway, in asking her to get me a, a, a Diet Pepsi, here's what it says. Okay, I need a house out of the picture. Would you get me a Diet Pepsi, please? Can you read the passage that the line Tyler away spirit in the office? Okay, so that's what I'm wondering if that's what we're reading. Here are your followers of immediately, I'm assuming. Thank you for the Pepsi, dear. <laughs> I know you all may not find that as funny as I do, but that was a crazy message. Um, Rod wants to know, what do we get out of Ahab sla slaughtering sheep and oxen in abundance? It wasn't done by a Levite. Is it a bad omen? Um, Rod, I'll give you my opinions, then everybody else can, but 
I don't think it was a sacrifice. I think they were having a party and he was slaughtering sheep and oxen uh, so they could cook it for, you know, all the people that were coming uh, to the party. Now, you know, it could have been a sacrifice, but I don't know. I don't think it was. That's my opinion for what it's worth. So, okay. So um, I'm, I'm about half confused here. Uh, So this could have been what I call, or what we call the little E Elohim, uh, that- uh, So where, where are you talking about? Because in the end of verse six, go up for the Lord. Uh, what I'm saying is, is that your translation is indicating that is not Yahweh, because it's not all caps, as you see up in verse five. That, that's the way your particular translations indicates or ge in, in yeah. general, right? Yeah. So that word, uh, go up for the Lord will give us, give it into the hand of the king is Elohim in the Hebrew. So why they translated it Lord there, I don't know. But my translation, New, New English, uh, translates it God, which it, and, and the word behind it is Elohim. And then verse seven, is there not a prophet of Yahweh here that we may inquire of him? So these 400 prophets were my reading of it and the, and the past is that these were basically prophets of Baal. Yes. They were not prophets of Yahweh. That's the way I take it. Uh, that makes perfect sense because they obviously are not prophets of the, the big E Elohim. Uh, so, you know, and, and, and another clue is that Jehoshaphat says, you know, hey, you, you got all of these pagan prophets here. Find me one from the one true God. Uh, that may we may inquire of him. I think that's another uh, uh, sign that 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 we're you know we're dealing with four hundred men who are not prophets of the Most High. Um, okay, so uh, the the. Uh, Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat forced Ahab to bring in his enemy. Now I'm talking about Ahab's enemy, Micaiah. He doesn't like Micaiah. Now, the reason he didn't like Micaiah is because Micaiah always spoke for, for God and, and didn't tell Ahab what Ahab wanted to hear. Um, and so these other 400 are saying, yeah, go for it. Go, you know, no problem. Because they knew what Ahab wanted to hear and they didn't want to displease him. And the king of Israel said, uh, please inquire. I'm sorry. Uh, please inquire of my my thing didn't advance. I thought it did. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, "Yeah, there's one. There's, there's one prophet uh, of your God, of your Elohim, but I hate him because he doesn't prophesy good concerning me, but evil. Well, which is really kind of funny because what he's prophesying to Ahab is not evil. What 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 Ahab wants is evil. It says he is M Micaiah." son of Imlah, but Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. And I, you know, I, I kept saying, what, what is he saying here? What do you mean, let not the king say so? So I, I went to other translations and here, I love what the complete Jewish Bible says. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, yes, there's still one man through whom we can consult Adonai, Yahweh, um, uh, Micaiah, these Hebrew things throw me. 
the son of Yimla, but I hate him because he doesn't prophesy good things for me, but bad. And uh, Jehoshaphat re replied, the king shouldn't say such a thing. This is one of the prophets of Yahweh. Y you know, Ahab, you ought to know better than to say something like that. Um, so here, here's something else that, that is a, uh, I'm going to step out on a limb here. Um, in verse nine, it says, then the king called an officer and said, bring quickly Micaiah, son of Imlah. Okay, well, number one, prophets have a tendency to disappear. They have a tendency to find a cave somewhere. They find, you know, how could, if this is the case, that, that Micaiah did the typical thing of, of, you know, making this statement and then leaving and getting out of the way, how could he bring him quickly unless he was already in prison? Now, I'm out on a limb, don't know, doesn't say. We know he ends up in prison, but I'm just wondering, was he already in prison? So anyway, now the king of Israel and, and Jehoshaphat, they, they were sitting on his throne, arrayed in their robes. Okay, so I, I can see Ahab setting this thing up. So hey, Jehoshaphat, we, we've got we've got this great prophet coming in here. We really need to dress up, and you know he's. I, I could just see Ahab trying to throw Micaiah off by them both dressing up in their in their fineries. But it, anyway, they were arrayed in their robes at the threshing floor, which is a an interesting term at the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all these 400 prophets were prophesying before them. Then Zedekiah, this is not the one that wrote the, the book. This is one of these prophets of Baal. I'm gonna agree with, with Mark 100%. Then Zedekiah, the son of Jenina, made horns of iron for himself he made him a hat. He made him, and you all have seen it, football games and stuff, especially if the University of Texas is playing, that some of the guys have on these hats that are horns, you know, longhorns. They're the Texas longhorns. And uh, so this Zedekiah said, thus says, I'm going to say little E. Elohim. I, I did not look this word up, Mark. Um, it, it's it probably is Yahweh. A, it's oh, Yahweh. It's Yahweh. He, yeah, it's thus says. See the cap, all the caps. That's yep. indicative of Yahweh. So he just he's saying, well, I'm 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 acting as a prophet of Yahweh. He's a false prophet. Yep. Okay. And he says, with with these, you will gore the Arame Arameans until they are consumed you talk about pride and ego and and uh zedekiah wants something from 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 ahab uh you know um so ahab's prophets as mark said and i agree 100 percent, had zero connection with yahweh and they were telling him hey go for it you can you can take ramoth gilead it's no big deal Yahweh is with you. And then, then I've got a question. What Lord they were speaking of is questionable, but I think we've I think we've answered that. They're they're talking about uh he, he's he's appropriating the name of Yahweh when he ain't with Yahweh. Verse 12. All the prophets were prophesying, thus saying. Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for Yahweh will give it into the hand of the king. Mark, is that Yahweh? It's all capped, so I would assume yes. Assume it would be, yeah. Okay, so the the messenger, 
So this this is one, another thing that's kind of funny. The messenger that Ahab sent to get Micaiah on his way into the throne room says, "Okay, now look. Let me let me give you a little uh, piece of advice here. Don't upset the king." But Micaiah says, "You know, sorry. I'm I'm just going to speak the words of Yahweh." And I find this very interesting because at first, Micaiah tells Ahab what he wants to hear. Now, there's a reason for that. Well, however, he must have spoken in a sarcastic tone or in a tone Ahab recognized that Micaiah was spoofing him. And verse uh, 13 it is where it says this. The, you know, we, we can skip all uh, through that. And in verse 15, he says, Micaiah, shall we go up to Ramoth Gilead or shall we refrain? And Micaiah answered, sure, go for it. Go and succeed. And Yahweh will give it into the hand of the king. And then the king said, how many times must I adjure you? Now, this is a word that means to be forced to 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 make you swear uh it was used against Jesus Christ uh when he was before uh and he could well i think that they were there but it was the king i'm trying to Herod uh, he was, uh, and, and if you remember, he didn't say anything. He didn't answer their questions. Uh, but when they adjured him, then he had to speak. And it's the same word. Uh, well, it's the, this is the Hebrew version of the same word. How many times must I adjure you to speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of Yahweh in this case? So, and I don't know how many of you all are going to appreciate my next comment. But the Jack Nicholson comes out of Micaiah. You want the truth? You can't handle the truth. For those of you who have seen the movie, you'll get uh, get get my point. So M Micaiah now gives him a metaphor about sheep. And the metaphor is about the northern tribes. And he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep, which have no shepherd. Huh, I wonder what he meant by that. This is a nation scattered on the mountains with no king. And Yahweh said, these have no master. Let each of them return to his house in peace. In this metaphor, he's he's basically saying he's going to say it again, but he's basically saying, "King's going to die. You're not going to have a king. You're going to be scattered on the mountains with no leader." Ahab recognized the metaphor, and he knew Micaiah was telling him that he would not survive the battle. Now I can't help but think that. Ahab didn't believe him. Um, you know, if 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 you know that a prophet of Yahweh, who you've heard be correct time after time after time after time, tells you in a metaphor that you're going to die, I don't know about you, I'm not going. You know, I, I, I'll get the message loud and clear. Uh, verse 18, then the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, didn't I tell you? He's not, look, look, now he's telling me I'm going to die. Now I'm putting words in their mouth there, but that, that I think is what uh, Ahab got out of this. Now, the, the next part's a little bit confusing. Um, because Ahab's prophets have already told him to go fight and Ramoth Gilead will be his, okay? This has already happened. 
the 400 are already up there. Yeah, go for it. It's, you know, you, 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 you. And Micaiah has said, nope, nope, you're not, you're not coming out of it alive. So Micaiah tells Ahab and all who are near enough to hear uh, that he, he talks about a conversation between Yahweh and his counsel or Elohim and his counsel. You know, we've talked about this. Mark uh, did a really great study on, on this. Was, it, was this a parable? Or was it a literal conversation between God's counsel? And also, why does it follow what has already been said? Now, granted, we've talked before about when you're writing something on papyrus or whatever, you know, you don't have correct type. Uh, you don't have the whiteout stuff. And and so maybe the author of of First Kings thought, oh, you know what? I left this out. I need to put it in. So anyway, Micaiah tells an, another metaphor or a parable or a literal conversation. It could be any of the three. Verse 19, hear the word of Yahweh. I saw Yahweh sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right and on his left. Now, I'm, I'm not going to say that, that, that God didn't open up, you know, the, the, uh, the heaven so that Micaiah could see that, but I, 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 I just don't think that's what's happening here. I think this is a, more of a, of a parable, but we don't know. But anyway, well, yeah. I, I, I think it's a vision. Okay, a vision. Okay. Yeah. I saw, so I, the, the, I think this is a peek into, you know, a divine council meeting, how God operates. So, I mean, that's, that, that would be, that's my. Yeah, I, you know, I can I can certainly go with with uh, with parable, and, and you're right. It says I saw, so that that makes more sense than um, than it being a metaphor. So so uh, I saw Yahweh sitting on his throne, and all the hosts of heaven. It's a, probably a vision standing by him on his right and on his left. So they're in the council room at, with the room or room in you know, in quotes, and Yahweh said, and, and this, doesn't this remind you of the conversation that, that, that he had with, uh, with, with Lucifer about Job? Yahweh said, who will entice Ahab to go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said this while another said that, you know, back and forth. And and if if it's a vision, uh, which most you know sounds like it probably is, this is what he was seeing in the vision. And then a spirit came forward and stood before Yahweh and said, "I'll entice him." And Yahweh said, "How are you going to do that?" And he said, "Well, I'll go out and be a, a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets." And and the the thing that gets me about this is they've already lied. Um, uh, so any, anyway, then, then he said, okay, go for it. Uh, do whatever you want to do, entice him and also prevail. Go and, go and do so. Um, so let, let's, it, it, unless somebody has a big objection, let's just leave this as, as what it looks like is a, uh, is yeah, a, I, it's a vision, but it may be something that took place before Yehoshaphat and Ahab even got together. Like this is a vision that he that 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 uh, uh, Micaiah might have had before he was called up to appear before the king because he's from this passage it looks like he's telling Ahab what he saw. It's sort of like a flashback. Yes, yeah, a flashback. This is what I saw because he mocked Ahab first and said, "Yeah, you go do whatever. You go on up and take uh, Ramoth Gilead," and then he, you know, Ahab gets mad because he knows he's being mocked. He's being ridiculed. Didn't I adjure you and tell you you're always supposed to tell me the truth from whatever Yahweh says? And then he 
tells a story about the sheep, and then he says, well, see what I tell you. You know, uh, I, I, he never tells me what I want to hear. He's always prophesying evil. And that's Ahab's character. Remember going back, Skip, you were telling us, and you did a great job illustrating it. He would literally throw a hissy fit every time he didn't get his way. Yep. Every time he was told no. Every single time he didn't get what he wanted. He's like a petulant adolescent. He, he gets mad. He sulks. He cries. He gets upset. He stomps his feet. You know, because he only wants to hear what he wants to hear. And this is another example of that. And I think that what M Micaiah is saying here from verse 19 on is he's explaining to Ahab the vision to, 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 to give weight to what he said about the sheep being scattered with, with no shepherd, that he's telling him what, the, uh, what he saw in his mind's eye, a vision from the Lord that took place before this, this uh, feast with Jehoshaphat uh, ever took place. Uh, is at least that's how I'm I'm uh, uh, seeing this. That this is a flashback, like 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 Mark suggested. This is what he saw, and he's he's emphasizing. I'm telling you the truth. This is what happened, and this is why I said that the sheep are going to be scattered. So that's how I take the, uh, these verses here. Yeah, that makes that 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 works. Makes sense. Now, and I threw in the 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 verse about Job. Then uh, Yahweh said to Satan. Behold, all that he has is in your power. Speaking of Job, only don't put your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. He didn't tell Satan to, to, to do anything. He allowed Satan to do it. And that's kind of the way I look back on this other, this other thing. Now, verse, verse 23 um, really gets me. I, I'm like, Josephat, I thought you were pretty smart, but every once in a while you do something that's not pretty smart. Micaiah says it loud and clear that disaster will occur if Ahab and Jehoshaphat go to war. And Jehoshaphat goes anyway. Now behold, Yahweh has put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets, and Yahweh has proclaimed disaster against you. Jo Jehoshaphat's hearing this. Yahweh has proclaimed disaster against you, and he goes anyway. Hey, Skip, is yeah. it possible? It may not be recorded, but is it, is it possible? that at Jehoshaphat's return, maybe he revealed this information to his family and his daughter-in-law uh, was all upset and said, you can't leave, you know, you have to go help my dad, you know, because otherwise there's going to be turmoil in the family. Just a thought, sure. just we brought up, we have a political marriage here. She's a lot like her mother Jezebel, and we've already seen how Jezebel operates in terms of manipulating Ahab and the king to do uh, what she wants. Is it possible this is another example in a smaller measure uh, for Jehoshaphat? That you know, because you're asking the question, well, why, if 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 the prophet of Yahweh and Micaiah says you're going to be destroyed, why would Jehoshaphat go up? And the thought is, based on what you covered, is it not possible that the 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 complaints and the whining and the in the chastisement of his daughter-in-law is the one that finally said, okay, I, you know to keep her quiet, I guess, or to do what she wanted. Maybe she's strong-willed like her mother is. Well, uh, she is She is almost as evil or maybe as evil as her mother. And we'll find out later on that she reigned for six years uh, after uh, after, 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 after Jehoram died. Uh, and she had, had murdered all of the descendants of King David, but one was hidden from her, or she would have wiped out his dynasty. Now, of course, God wouldn't have let that happen, but but still, I mean, she she was not a sweet lady, you know. So, yeah, you may be exactly right. Well, how many, how many times have we seen prime ministers, presidents, governors, mayors, whoever it is, 
give in to some kind of pressure, political pressure, cultural pressure, or whatever against or uh, give in to those things and not do the thing they probably thought was really the right thing to do, but they gave in to the political pressure. Is, is it? It's a common thing. Can, can I get by with saying every time? <laughs> Good. That's right. <laughs> All right. So, well, I think, yeah, Jill. Uh, the fact that they, um, the word entice is used, um, and you're not, a person is not enticed by something that they don't want. Um, and that was the conversation in the council was uh, who will entice him, you know, so it, it's like um, they wanted uh, using the word entice implies that they, there was a result that the king wanted that that would tempt him that he would fall for it because it appealed to his vanity and and all that other stuff. So. Um, you know, the the enticement part um, plays into it in that um, got, you know, Yahweh understood that that he was motivated by pride and whatever else, you know. Um, and again, like Mark said, the political, you know, looking, coming out smelling like a rose is always good for a politician. Um, and so they played into that they were able to play into that weakness that he had. Yeah, that, yep, I would, I would, I would agree with that. Um, and, and also, you, you know, I don't know that you can be in, I think you kind of said this, but you can't be enticed to do something that you didn't kind of want to do to begin with. Uh, I, you know, that's kind of part of what you were, what you were saying, okay. First Kings 22, 23, we did that. Okay. Now, we, we run across this guy named Zedekiah again. I say again, I think we've had him once before. But anyway, he's not the one that wrote the book. And he was under the false illusion that he, not Micaiah, was speaking for Yahweh. And he, and, he, and he makes this comment, when did the spirit or how did the spirit of Yahweh pass from me to speak to you? Now, I know we're not supposed to do this, but I would question whether he had the spirit of, of Yahweh to begin with. I, I, I just can't see one of these false prophets having God's Holy Spirit, but anyway. Uh, so, you know, when he said, how did the spirit of Yahweh pass from me to speak to you? My answer was, it didn't. It didn't pass from you to me. Uh, and Micaiah said, behold, you shall see that. You shall see on that day when you enter an inner room to hide yourself. Uh, he's implying that this disaster of a war is going to lead to another nation coming in and taking over the northern tribes. And we, we, of course, we know who ultimately did that. So to prison or back to prison for a prophet of Yahweh who only spoke the truth to a king, but Micaiah says something interesting in these next verses. Then the king of Israel said, take Micaiah and return him to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son. And, say, and by the way, the, the, the commentary said that uh, this Joash was uh, uh, considered the king's son, that he wasn't actually the king's son. But anyway. And say, thus says the king, put this man in prison and don't feed him. Give him a little bit of bread and water until I return safely. 
And here comes Micaiah again. And Micaiah said, if you return safely, then I'm a false prophet. Because it's not going to happen. You're not going to return safely. Um, and then the, 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 the listen all you people is not in all translations, so I'm, I'm not going to go over that. Now, <clears throat> here's another event that I find difficult to understand why Jehoshaphat agreed to it. And the only answer I have is that Jehoshaphat knew God would protect him. So here's the crazy thing that Ahab talked him into doing. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, went up against Ramoth Gilead, and the king of Israel said this, said, okay, I'm going to disguise myself, and I'm going to look like a regular soldier, but you need to put on your robes. You need to look like a king because Ahab knew that he was the target for the men of uh, of uh, Ramoth Gilead. So the king of Israel disguised himself and went into the battle. And maybe, uh, maybe he kind of secretly was um, thinking, maybe Micaiah, maybe I better take a little bit of a uh, precaution if Micaiah is right and I can avoid getting killed. After all, God had done some you know, pretty amazing things, like uh, on the on Mount Carmel, et cetera. Are you talking about Ahab or Jezebel or uh, Jehoshaphat? Ahab. Ahab. Oh, oh Ahab. Maybe Ahab. Ahab was thinking, um, maybe I better take a precaution because I heard Micaiah say this. Yeah. Um, I think you're exactly right. Now, the part the part about Jehoshaphat, it, it doesn't say it in this particular verse, uh, but I hate to I hate to put it this way, but Jehoshaphat fell for this, that he was to go into the battle with all of his robes, looking like a king, so that you know, and Ahab is is going. Well, I'm going to go in looking like a soldier. And so the whole enemy is going to go over and start chasing uh, Ye Jehoshaphat. Uh, and in, in verse 31, it says the king of Aram, Aram had commanded his 32 captains, said, you know, don't fight with regular soldiers. We're after the king of Israel. So when the captains of the chariot saw Jehoshaphat dressed in his finery, they said it's the king of Israel. So yeah, you're exactly right. Ahab went out looking like a regular soldier and he wanted Jehoshaphat to, to dress up like a king. Now, I can't help but think that Jehoshaphat knew God would protect him. And I, you know, I don't have a problem with that at all. I think that's what's going on here. But Anyway, when they saw Jehoshaphat, they, they, they yelled, it's the king of Israel, and they all turned and ran after. But Jehoshaphat cried out. Now, we don't know what he cried out, but I'm betting he cried out something to Yahweh. Uh, because it says, and Yahweh helped him. And God diverted them from him. Because when the captains of the chariot saw that it, it wasn't the king of Israel. And they, so they must have gotten pretty close. They turned back from pursuing him. So when the captains of the chariot saw Jehoshaphat, they said, surely it's the king of Israel. And they turned aside to fight against him. It's kind of redundant, but, but it's, it's in there. And Jehoshaphat cried out. No, it isn't redundant. I put it in there twice, didn't I? Huh. Okay. When the captains of the chariot saw it wasn't the king of Israel, they turned from pursuing him. And then, you know, uh, Micaiah had told Ahab, granted, in a in a in a in a uh, parable or in a metaphor, you're going to die. 
this plain soldier, a bowman, drew his bow at random and shot somebody. And it turned out that it was Ahab. And the arrow didn't bounce off the armor. It went through one of the joints. So he said to the driver of his chariot, hey, get me out of here. I'm dying. And the battle raged that day and the king was propped up in his chariot in front of the Arameans and he died that evening and the blood from the wound ran into the bottom of the chariot. Now remember the the uh, uh, prophecy of, uh, I believe it was Elijah that said your, your blood is, is going to uh, be licked up by the dogs. Well, that's what ultimately happens here. It says, then a cry passed out through, passed throughout the army close to sunset and said, all right, everybody get home. King's dead. So the king died, was brought to Samaria, and they buried the king, okay? But the chariot had all of his blood in it, or a lot of his blood in it. And they washed the chariot uh, by the pool of Samaria, and the dogs licked up his blood. And then it, it says the harlots bathed themselves there, according to the work word of Yahweh, which he spoke. Sorry, I get the hiccups. And then now the rest of the acts of Ahab and all that he did and the ivory house, which he built. We talked about that last week or week before last about that he was a good general and he was a, a, a good builder and, and uh, did a lot of construction. Uh, it says, uh, and the ivory house, which he built, that's the castle. I mean, the, the palace and all the cities which he built, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? So Ahab died. He slept with his fathers and Ahaziah, his son, became king in his place. Now we're talking about the northern tribes. Um, now the red, okay. So what what I wanted to do here was to add uh, something about um, Jehoshaphat We're talking about his dad now the rest of the acts of Asa and all his might and all that he did and the cities which he built are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah and here but in the time of his old age, he was diseased in his feet. This is that three years that his son reigned, Jehoshaphat reigned with him. And verse 24 says, Asha died. He slept with his father and was buried. And Jehoshaphat reigned in his place. Now I got to catch up on my notes here. Okay. Now at verse 41, I don't know what happened to verse 41 because there's verse two. Okay, I'm, I'll read this first. Ahab was tw Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And guess what? He didn't do what was right in the sight of Yahweh, his God, as his father David had done. You know, we have, we have kings in Judah that also were not good kings. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure why I even put that in there. Oh, I'm, okay, I know why. All right, so talking about this Ahaz, King Ahaz, uh, who, let me look at my chart, and I'll tell you when he reigned. Um, he reigned in 735 BC after Jotham, after who reigned after Uzziah, who reigned after Amaziah, who reigned after Joash, who reigned after Ahab's daughter, uh, and, and so on. So we're 
this is further down the, the line, but there's a point I'm trying to make here. Talking about he didn't obey God, but he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Now, this is a king of Judah. Uh, but he walked in the way of the kings of, of, of Israel and even made his son pass through the fire. And we know what that means. He sacrificed his own son according to the abominations of the nations whom Yahweh had driven out from before the sons of Israel. And he sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. Now this is happening down in Judah. Okay. Um, A me... little leaven leavens the whole lump, folks. That's exactly right. Okay. But, Along came Hezekiah, who removed the high places again. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you all a little bit of whiplash here. So, but along came Hezekiah, who removed the high places, and, and they, but then they were rebuilt by Manasseh and then destroyed by Josiah. You know, the, 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 whip, the whiplash in the, in the south was crazy. You had good, then bad, then good, 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 then bad kings of Judah. I mean, it was, it was uh, switched back and forth. But in Israel, no whiplash. Bad, bad, bad king. Worse, worse ever. Even worse than him. You know, it, it, it was, all of this was going on for generation after generation after generation. But here we're going to back up and talk about Jehoshaphat again. Now, Jehoshaphat, who was the son of Asa, became king in the fourth year of Ahab. Now, if, I, if you remember, I showed you earlier the dates. And Ahab and, and uh, uh, Jehoshaphat reigned almost year for year. And it says Jehoshaphat was 35 when he became king, and he reigned for 25 years and his mother's name was Azuba, the daughter of, of Shilhi. Now, one of the things about these mothers that are mentioned, it's one of two things. Either they were a terrible mother and, and they raised their son to not worship Yahweh, or they were a good mother. In this case, it was a good mother. And he walked in all the way of Asa, his father. Asa was a good king. And we're, we're, in, we're in Judah now, the southern tribes. He didn't turn aside from it, doing right in the sight of Yahweh. However, the high places were not taken away, and the people still sacrificed and burnt incense on the high places. As I, I mentioned earlier, that, that, that right almost from the start of the Several people in in Judah were worshiping the pagan gods, uh, and then verse forty four is one of these another one of these blew me away things. Uh, but like you know, you all have said, and and, and you're exactly right. Um, they made a secular union. Now it, it's pretty clear how the peace was made between the two kings. Ahab's daughter was given in marriage to Jehoshaphat's son. Huge, huge mistake, uh, but we'll discuss it later. Let's just say she had a lot of her mother Jezebel in her, and we, we'll talk about that in 2 Kings chapter 11. And verse 45 says, now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat and his might, which he showed and how he warred, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles? And we don't have copies of that. It's not in the scriptures. Uh, but here's one thing that he did. He removed the Sodomites who remained in the days of his father Asa. He expelled from the land. And as I understand it, Sodomites were male prostitutes, were, were uh, gay, uh, homosexual. Now, Jehoshaphat did many more things as king to both restore the worship of the Most High God and, and to strengthen his nation. And here are a few of them. 
He fortified the cities of Judah. He followed the example of David. He did not seek the Baals. He followed God's commandments. He removed the high places in the ashram from Judah. Now, he didn't remove all of them, and some of them were, were built back, but he, you know, he made a good effort at that. He expelled the rest of the male prostitutes from the land. And I, I had to put this in there because I couldn't believe it. I, oh, oh, I, I took the term... Uh, uh, shoot, what was, uh, I gotta go back. Sodomites, okay. One common, one commentary said that he couldn't figure out what the comment, that what the, the uh, sodomites were, were doing, what they were for. And I'm like, I can't believe you've put this in a, in a commentary, but he, he did. Uh, Yoshevat also set teachers among the Levites uh, along with, I, I mistyped that. Set, he set teachers along with the Levites to teach the book of the law in all the cities of Judah. Yahweh was with him, so other nations feared Judah. He built storehouses four times of drought. He built a great army to protect Judah. He brought the people back to Yahweh. Now, that's obviously not 100%, but he brought a whole bunch of them back. He set his heart to seek God, and he appointed judges in the land and charged them to judge for Yahweh, not for man. And these are these are some of the things that Jehoshaphat did. Now, here, here, here again, and I know I've said this two or three times today, this is another one of those, where in the world did that come from? Why, is the, why are these verses in here? They don't have anything to do with anything we've talked about up to this point. So suddenly we're reading about Edom and ships that Jehoshaphat built but never sailed. I have no idea why this is in here. Um, <clears throat> there was no king in Edom, okay? So they, they were politically, uh, you know, they were a mess. The deputy was king. And so Jehoshaphat made ships of Tarshish to go to Ophir for gold, but the ships were broken up at Ezion Geber. In other words, God didn't want this to happen. He didn't want the ships uh, from from Jehoshaphat to go to get the gold and the, and the silver. And then Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, okay, so we know this isn't a good king. He said to Jehoshaphat, well, let, let my servants go with your servants in the ships. Yeah, right. But Jehoshaphat was not willing. And then he died. Jehoshaphat slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Jehoram, his son, became king in his place. Now, I want to warn you about something. There's more than one Jehoram. There's a Jehoram that's the king of the north. And there's a Jehoram that's a king of the south. So don't get confused when when we get into that. If you're doing uh, if you're doing your own study and you're reading ahead, be sure and look at context and see what what nation uh, that that the, that Jehoram is done. He's also called Joram. Uh, okay, so we're, we're introduced to this new king. Uh, of the northern tribes. Um, and it says, Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, so we know what a great, wonderful man this was, became king over the northern tribes in Samaria in the 17th year 
of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. And he reigned for two years. He didn't reign for 25 or 30 or 50. He reigned two. And he did evil in the sight of Yahweh. And he walked in the way of his father and in the way of his mother. Think about that. He walked in the way of his father. That would be Ahab. And he walked in the way of his mother, that wonderful lady, Jezebel. And he walked in the way of Jeroboam. You know, and we've seen this 14 times about the way of Jeroboam who sinned and caused Israel to sin. So he served Baal and worshiped him and provoked Yahweh Elohim God of, I'm sorry, he provoked Yahweh Elohim of Israel to anger according to all that his father had done. Ahazi only ruled two years. How in the world did he get all of the bad stuff done in just two years? And why did he only reign for two years? And here we have the answer to that. Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. So he fell. Now, I'm sure all of you have fallen. I fell off a ladder and shattered my heel into about 100 pieces. And that was just my foot. So this, this king Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber and was sick. And we'll talk about that next time. Uh, that's it. Thoughts, comments, corrections? A correction. All right. On my part. You know, you were asking, um, I think, why the uh, writer of Kings uh, just mentioned the king of Israel and did not give a name. And I mentioned that I thought it might be, I speculated that it might be out of just showing disrespect, by just giving the title and not the name. But I, you know, I don't think we have any trouble at all, at least in our culture, if we want to criticize one of our leaders to attach their name to their title. Sometimes we'll do other things to show disrespect. We might not even mention their title or just mention their la whatever. And I'm thinking that uh, the writer of Kings, um, maybe Jeremiah, I don't know. I don't know if we know for sure, but uh, just gave his audience credit for knowing who um, he was talking about. And it was nothing more than that. So I want to dial my remarks back because the author of Chronicles, maybe Ezra, I don't know who it was, but had no problem with attaching name and title. So. Um, I think it's just a matter of uh, writing technique. It's all meta more than than just showing disdain. Yeah, but it could have been both. And I also have heard or read that that there's a lot of conjecture that Jeremiah was the writer of uh, uh, First and Second Kings. Um, so, okay, thanks, Tom. Anybody else? Okay, I think we had Bible study, Skip. I Thanks. thought it was good. I enjoy, of course, you know me. I love the discussion, uh, and and uh, I think that's the the best part of these. Uh, certainly, the best part of these Bible studies. Well, and, and uniquely about this, it was interesting. <laughs> yeah, Great. that's how you start every single Bible study. And it is. I know it. I know it. Michael uh, and, and, and Diane, I think, are the two that used to give me such a hard time about using the word interesting. Uh, <laughs> and I do. I do. Well, that's because I was trying to decipher whether or not it was a, a, a negative uh, or whether it was an ambivalent. I always looked at it as, oh, that's, that's Skip's way of saying, okay, uh, that, that's Skip's judicious way of saying, 
uh, I'm acknowledging what you're saying, but I think you're 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 an idiot type of a. <laughs> I mean, he comes that in, in the word interesting. Hey, hey Skip. Yeah, Jim. Uh, uh, I would like to, with your permission, give an assignment to Diane to remind you to repent of your small arrow. <laughs> I will do that. <laughs> Between, well, it, it, you know, it, if if it works on PowerPoint, uh, it's just great. And and even with a big one, you can live with it uh, on other things. But it uh, it sure helps on the maps. And I just love those maps. But sometimes it's my old eyes have trouble following it. But I'm, I've got three years on you, so that's probably the reason. Yeah, well, I could if you all can see this. I could I could choose all kinds of colors, um, but yes, there is a control, <clears throat> and I will make myself a note, and Diane will remind me to change cursor size. Yes, as as Rumple of the Bar used to say. He who must be obeyed will remind you. That's right. That's, that's how he always referred to his wife. <laughs> yeah. Wait, wait, I didn't hear that right. He referred to his wife as he who should. I, I said she who must be obeyed. Okay. You said actually said he who must be obeyed. Like, wait a minute. We... No, no, that ain't right. Uh, right. It, no. No, no, no transit. No transgender stuff. Yeah, oh yeah, we're not talking about Pete B B Booty Gig or Judge or whatever his name is. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a that's a good name, uh, Michael. But we won't get into that. Okay, anybody else? I thought we had a a, a really good Arthur. You had said much today. You got anything to add? Well, I was observing. Um... We are looking at words on paper, thousands of years apart from the actual action, uh, action. And we can only go so uh, far into that. And when we realize the, the blood and the guts and the gore and the horror of much of what took place, which doesn't come off the pages, but we can recognize that these were very, very difficult times to live in and very cruel times to live in. And so the disobedience to God during that period of time brought on these terrible trials for who knows how many people were slaughtered and killed in these battles and so forth. It's, it's a, really is a record and a chronology of what humanity does to itself, even in the light of knowing the Almighty. And so... I can see a parallel with what's taking place there and what is happening today with the cyber attacks to Israel from Iran, which has just come across my uh, messages here. Um, the troubles we're having uh, with the Far East at large, we are in a certain way living parallel stories, but not with so much love and hand to hand. Well, thanks for bringing us down. <laughs> well, you know, I'm going to be a realist. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think, uh, I think the, the things we've gone through in study about, about Ahab are really much more than I've ever thought about. You know, here is a guy who we all knew was bad. But, you know, we've really thought about some of those things. And then the thing that strikes me is even amongst his awfulness, God could show patience and mercy. But when that was rejected, you know, the ultimate uh, penalty was brought because that whole scene with the divine council shows that God had just had enough. Yeah. That uh, uh, even when he said, 
no, I'm going to let I'm going to let him skate. He's not going to suffer this, you know, the demise of all of his family in his in his age. He still wouldn't change, wouldn't really turn to the to God as he was given an opportunity, and then then the uh, council uh, carried out the judgment of. Almighty God. Yeah, and that's consistent. You know, I've, I've been cheating because I've jumped ahead and uh, looking into the writing prophets, especially having to do with this time period that we've been covering with the Northern tribes. And uh, what you said, Mark, is is uh, strikingly consistent in, uh, like, let's say, the, the uh, again, the book of Amos, uh, where you see that where uh, Amos is pleading with God, are you really going to destroy these people? They're so small. And God repents and relents, you know, and, uh, and and gives them some grace. But finally, he gets to the point where he tells Amos, he says, okay, what do you see? And he goes, I, I, yeah, I see a plumb line. He goes, well, that's it. This is, this is it. This is the final straw. I'm not, I'm not relenting anymore. I'm done. We're done. We're, 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 Israel's done. And, uh, and, and that's, you know, consistent with exactly with what you said uh in terms of uh, of god's character or yahweh elohim's character that he's very patient he's very forgiving uh but there comes a point in time where it's just too much it, it's just they're not gonna they're not going to change it's not going to be a change for the better and that's when god's sorry that's it we have we have to nip this in the bud and, and put an end to it yeah and i just uh, pulled up uh, malachi the last 10 words uh uh, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And uh, we're not we're not far from that, although I think that we're getting some of the curse part now. Um, you know, this place is a mess. I mean, it's an absolute mess. So, okay, anybody else? All right. Uh, Mark, would you close us out today? Father in heaven, thank you very much for your righteousness. We pray that you would put it into us. Thank you for the sacrifice of your son to cleanse us and make us white in your sight. You're so merciful. We appreciate that grand vision that you have and we thank you very much for this fellowship that we've had today help us to worship you and spread the truth we pray for these things in jesus name amen amen don't forget start eating 